My name is Manoldis Kellis, and I have devoted my career to studying the products of evolution so we can put an end to evolution as we know it. We all marvel at the products of evolution, and there is really much to marvel. On one hand, if you look at your own bodies, it's very difficult to conceive just how complex of a machine each of you is running. Your body plan, your bones, your muscles, your circulatory system, your breathing, your metabolism, taking parts from the outside and making them your own. We're still dreaming of being able to design machines that can actually do that. And your developmental body plan, starting from a single cell and through a series of cell divisions of an identical automaton giving rise to the plan that you have, a fully functional, extremely interconnected system of interacting parts. And then there's your brain, what allows you to listen to this talk and to give talks of your own. The circuitry of your brain alone is encoded in a very small number of genes compared to these trillions of connections that it has. It enables language, memory, reasoning, integration of your senses, and thinking ahead, imagining, planning, dreaming. And then there's our senses, how our brain interacts with the outside world. If you look at eyesight, the ability to take in light, make sense of it, the deep neural networks working inside your visual cortex to interpret everything that you're seeing, these are truly marvels of evolution. And we also have the most horrible part of evolution, what we're experiencing now. The virus evolving in front of our eyes, viruses, pathogens, our immune system evolving to adapt to them and to fight them. This evolutionary arms race between defenses and attackers, invasive species, pandemics, all of this is coexisting in our world. But we also marvel at the simplicity of evolution, the beauty of Darwin's model, separating the two components of beautiful but completely random mutation, generating diversity. And from that diversity, brutal selection, selecting for the survival of the fittest. This led to this very brutal view of evolution, full of extinction, replacement, where the winners get to pass on their genes and their losers are simply going extinct over generations. And there's a cost to that selfishness, a cost to everybody being out there for their own, to propagate their own genes. Species that are simply too egotistical, species that are sort of so good at this competitive game, will end up disrupting food chains, will end up destroying their own ecosystems. And our species is perhaps at the brink of doing that, and we have to really reconsider whether we really want to be so good at exploiting all of these resources. But as a computer scientist, I can't help but realize that what we call evolution is basically what in <clears throat> computer science we call brute force search. It's basically completely random. You're just exploring all of the search space, creating billions of copies of every one of your programs, and just letting them fight against each other. This is just brutal. It's also extremely slow. It took us billions of years to get here. And look at human acceleration and how much has happened in the last blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. So can we speed up evolution? Can we work faster? Can we make it less messy? If you look at our own genome, and I have, it's very messy. There's like circuits that don't really make sense. Wires, not just crossing, but actually touching each other. You turn on one gene and there's like another hundred genes that turn on with it, and we don't really know why or how. Of course, that has given it robustness, but from an engineer's perspective, this has also given us a lot of diseases and disorders. And the worst part of evolution is its brutality, the suffering, the loss. We cannot afford to simply have a lot of humans dying every time we want to adapt to a new environment, every time our climate changing, having half of the human population dying. This is not how we want to move forward. Evolution is also extremely inefficient. If you look at the trail of bodies that it has left, there's these incredible body plans, incredible solutions. Every bacterium out there has invented solutions that are just incredibly elaborate, and all of these are just going by the wayside. There are genes, there are machines, there are solutions that are just tiny little gems in a carcass of extinct species. So how do we go beyond that? Can we do better? And if you look at humanity, we're already doing better. 
we have basically let our better selves, our better angels, take over. We are not killing people like Sparta used to, throwing the weaklings off the mountain. We are truly saving diversity. If you look at Stevie Wonder, if you look at Stephen Hawkins, if you look at Teddy Roosevelt, if you look at countless artists and creators and engineers and scientists who are handicapped, who would have just not made it in ancient Sparta, we are the Athens of the new world, fostering the arts, providing the ability to so many different minds to create, regardless of how weak their body might be. And despite having this shift from what I call vertical evolution to horizontal evolution, humanity has not only not died, but it has thrived. Let's, let me explain vertical evolution. In a Darwinian sense, every nuclear fam family is a silo. Every duck passes its own ways of doing things to its offspring in a very vertical, narrow kind of way. And that's how humanity used to be. Every parent would only teach their children their ways of life, and so on and so forth for every generation. Knowledge was passed vertically. Genes were passed vertically. Resources were all passed vertically from the parents to the offspring. What I would like to argue is that humanity is already experiencing a horizontal form of evolution, where from every generation to the next, you have knowledge spreading horizontally. You have the printing press, you have the internet, the World Wide Web, Wikipedia. As soon as a discovery is made, Google Scholar allows me to find it wherever it was made in the world, by archive before it's even gone through peer review. If you look at wealth, it's no longer passed in resources, it's no longer passed vertically. Because of taxation, and thanks to taxation, wealth is passed horizontally, allowing people like all of us to focus on each of our own creative juices while having the resources to help our family, provide food, provide shelter. And if you look at genetics, it's no longer contained in a single region. The diversity of humanity is now traveling across the world and mixing and matching extremely diverse phenotypes and genotypes across the world. So I would like to argue that competition in human species has been replaced by collaboration. That despite having a fixed cognitive hardware, we have software upgrades that are enabled by culture, by the 20 years that our children spend in school to fill their brains with everything that humanity has learned, regardless of which family came up with it. That allows diverse skill sets and specialization. And this is the secret to our great acceleration. Evolution vertically does not lead to exponential growth, but evolution horizontally does. And that's what we're experiencing today. But the suffering still continues. If you look at infections, we've experienced this year, this dramatic loss of lives and livelihoods. If you look at our changing environment, by optimizing our industries for food scarcity, we have now turned the other way, fighting with obesity, with diabetes, with cancer. In my own family, my uncle died from brain cancer. My father died from vascular dementia after a stroke. I have predispositions to blindness, type 2 diabetes, obesity. Every one of you carries mutations and environmental changes and all kinds of other impact that predispose you to countless diseases. If you look at the expanding human lifespan, Alzheimer's is becoming a greater and greater cause of mortality in an aging population. New diseases that we don't yet have names for are starting to appear. So how do we transform pharma to meet these new needs? Our current approach is simply insufficient. We are treating manifestations of disease, not the causes of disease. We're thinking of Alzheimer's, of cancer, of diabetes, of obesity, as monolithic disorders with a single name, when in fact every patient is dramatically different. We're ignoring that diversity in the manifestation of all of those disorders in any one individual. We have also silos of departments with cardiovascular departments, neurodegenerative departments, diabetes departments, not talking to each other, even though all of these diseases are extremely multifaceted and are in fact sharing a common set of under, underpinnings. 
So what we want to do in my lab is transform medicine and focus on the commonalities of all of these different disorders. We have realized across our field that polygenicity is underlying every disorder, that there are thousands of variants, each of which is affecting disease only a tiny little amount, but are converging into a small number of pathways. These are the hallmarks of disease. These are the causal pathways through which genetic predisposition manifests. And it's only by understanding these pathways that we can truly manipulate the disease causation and reverse the disease circuitry. Every patient has a different combination of these hallmarks to a different extent. We need to build new treatments using these hallmarks. Instead of thinking of every patient as a new clinical trial, which is simply economically infeasible, we have to think of every, every pathway as a clinical trial. And every new patient will be a combination of clinical trials that have already been done. We want to understand the burden of every patient for each of these pathways, each of these hallmarks, through their genetic mutations, epigenomic alterations, transcriptional and proteomic changes, and treat the causes for each individual. What we want to do is bridge the gap between genetic variation and disease to understand how genetic variants are acting through all of these pathways and how these are influenced by environmental and by disease states. So what we're doing in my team is systematically bridging the gap between genetic variation across common and rare variants. We're profiling systematically at single cell resolution millions of individual cells across thousands of individuals at the transcriptome and at the epigenome level to understand the circuitry. We are then integrating all these tools using machine learning techniques to understand what are the driver genes, regions, and pathways underlying each of these disorders. We then have a set of diverse collaborations for every one of these pathways to start manipulating it in human cells and in animal models. And of course, we disseminate the results and start the cycle all over again. We have now done this across countless disorders. We're looking at cardiac disease, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, autism, schizophrenia, Down syndrome, obesity, metabolic disorders, depression, aging. Looking across thousands of cells, dozens of cell types, and all of the molecular and cellular manifestations of disease. What we're ending up is a circuit for every disease region. Instead of saying, there's something vaguely going on here, we know who are the individual nucleotides. What regulatory control regions do they act in? What tissues do they become active in? What are their target genes? Who are their upstream regulators? That has allowed us to start intervening by manipulating these circuits. I am a homozygous risk carrier of the strongest genetic association with obesity. This is the circuit that underlies my own cells. We have uncovered this circuit in collaboration with an incredible team, and we have shown that the region of association that spans 50,000 nucleotides can be traced down to a single nucleotide alteration. We have found the upstream regulator. We have found that this controls a new pathway that was previously unknown that is a master controller of a process known as thermogenesis. Inside our fat cells, we can choose to store excess calories in our diet or to burn them as heat. And my cells are stuck on the store position. They're unable to burn them. And by manipulating the circuits, we can reverse my own cells and the cells of every person in this room. We can basically go and change the upstream regulator, go and change the downstream target genes, and maybe even go and edit a single nucleotide variant to reverse the code of adipocytes, not on the germline, but perhaps somatically. And what we have shown is that these alterations, by changing a single nucleotide in primary adipocytes from homozygous risk individuals, can completely restore the process of thermogenesis. When we go into mice, the mice lose 50% of their body weight. They completely deplete their fat stores. You can feed them all the fat you want, they cannot store it, they simply burn it as heat. We don't want to just stop there. We have built a series of resources for the entire world that we have put out for free for everyone. We have generated the reference protein coding gene set using evolutionary signatures of how proteins change. 
a reference set of controlled genomic elements using their epigenomic signatures, a reference set of genomic circuits using genome folding, correlated activity, and genetics, a set of the dynamics of how these elements turn on and off across tissue cells and individuals, understanding variation, how genetics, environment, exposures, lifestyle, and aging are impacting these circuits, and the causal mediation path of how genetic variants that are causal for disease are affecting these circuits. So I want to make a call to action for every single person in this room and everyone who can hear this talk. We need as many participants in this cause to end human disease, to end vertical Darwinian evolution as we know it. If you're in computer science, we need the best machine learning tools to infer the circuitry. If you're in biology, we need new techniques for high-throughput profiling and high-throughput dissection and manipulation of these circuits. If you're in biotechnology, we need new technologies for profiling, for rewiring, for delivery. If you're in finance, we need new models for long-term 10-year, 20-year bio bonds that will mature in a long enough time that the technologies can truly be de developed so that pharma doesn't focus on the short term. If you're in pharma, we need partnerships, sharing of compound libraries. We need academic, industry, hospital collaborations, spaces where we are fostering a culture of bridging the gaps of knowledge and of empowering the new dis discoveries in a pre-competitive sharing kind of way. If you're a patient, we need, we, we need new empowerment tools for personalization, for sharing of data, for collaboration. And if you're working in a hospital, we need to combine cohorts to increase the power. So we are currently doing this. We're engaging all of these different players, all of these different parties, to change evolution as we know it, to change humanity and human suffering as we know it. So I want you all to join this cause. I want to put an end to Darwinian evolution. I want to put an end to randomness and then to suffering and brutality. Instead, allow the diversity of skills across the human population. Enable health for all, but allow diversity for everything else. Adapt humanity to new climates, new planets. Study the products of evolution to help bring an end to evolution as we know it. Thank you.